Dear Professor Norris, dear members of the International Scientific Advisory Board of Contrast, dear panel participants, dear Professor Deitloff, Professor Foss, Professor Hedinger, dear colleagues, guests, and friends, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the Executive Board of the University to the second annual conference of the Cluster Initiative Contrast, Trust in Conflict, Political Life Under Conditions of Uncertainty. I'm very happy to see so many people gathered here in the building of normative orders and for those joining us virtually, wherever this might be. As vice president of Goethe University for Research, I've been able to follow this project for quite a while. Since 2021, it receives funding by Goethe University and the state of Hesse to support a possible application in the next round of German, the German Excellence Strategy. And thanks to the continuous reports and presentations that had to be delivered, and I know the PIs don't like this, but it was mandatory, I, at least I have learned a lot about the project of contrast. And I, I know that it really pursues a timely demanding research question and addressing very important national and international questions. In the time of climate change, in the time of a global pandemic, in a time where there's war in Ukraine and rising right-wing parties, it seems more important than ever to deal with questions and the correlations between trust, conflicts, and uncertainties, and to find possible ways to strengthen social coherence and confidence. And in the following two days, you will have the opportunity to address exactly these issues. The various dynamics of social conflicts, the role of trust and uncertainty in these situations, and the intriguing idea that trust might be an outcome of conflicts if we just argue and act in the right way. Regarding its research program, contrasts, fits, and complements the profile of Goethe University perfectly. It is at the heart of the interdisciplinary research profile, Orders and Transformation, that analyzes social structures and the changes when confronted when confronted with new circumstances and set points. The fact that there has been six new professional appointments with direct links to contrast shows how deeply rooted the project has been with the different and participating faculties. Furthermore, it matches very well our tradition as a citizen university. It were the inhabitants of Frankfurt that founded our university in 1914 and that had been supporting our university from the early days on. Due to this history, Goethe University feels particularly obliged to the citizens of Frankfurt and the public as a whole. It is one of our main concerns to make scientific knowledge not only comprehensible, but also usable for society. With the prospect to develop our understanding of how conflicts can become a source of social and political trust. Contrast is a striking example for such a socially engaged research project that helps to tackle the urgent questions of our time. This requires, of course, the intense dialogue with our stakeholders and the public in the sense of knowledge transfer. And interestingly enough, such dialogues are at the same time the object of your research when examining social debates and conflicts in different areas and settings. It is obvious that media nowadays plays a crucial role in formation and carrying of conflicts. For example, if you consider the quarrels on Twitter, Facebook, or some of the US broadcast stations taking clear positions in the presidential election. I think therefore it's a great gain for contrast that Vincent Hedinger now, as an expert for film and media studies has joined Nicole Deitelhoff and Rainer Foss as a co-spokesperson of the Cluster Initiative. Another big asset of the project is the successful integration of Peace Research Institute Frankfurt. And I would like to thank the Institute and all its researchers for the long lasting and trustful cooperation with Goethe University. And last but not least, Contrast can rely on our proven strengths in humanities and social sciences and the experience that our researchers in transforming this expertise in fruitful research. I'm very optimistic that Contrast 
will be a highly visible and successful project in the following years. Before I hand over to Vincent Sedinger, please allow me to thank all of those people who contributed to Contrast and their great commitment to make this possible. And of course, I'd like to extend these thanks to the Hessian Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science and the Arts for its strong support of this initiative. I wish you all exciting conference, interesting presentations, stimulating discussions, and perhaps some trust producing conflicts. Thank you. Thank you very much to our Vice President for Research, uh, Professor Bernhard Brüne, uh, for this wonderful introduction. My name is Vincent Hediger, and I am one of the three leaders of this initiative, together with Nicole Deitloff and uh, Rainer Forst. And I want to open proceedings uh, by telling you or reminding you of what it is that we do here, even though uh, Bernhard Brüne uh, gave a wonderful layout of our research project already, so I'm just uh, going to footnote uh, what he said. Um, <clears throat> one of the key points is that this is currently um, a research center funded by the Hessian uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Culture, uh, which is supposed to be transformed by a process of metamorphosis through competitive evaluation into a longer term uh, cluster of excellence with a potential duration of uh, up to uh, 15 years. We're gathered here together, the PIs and our um, uh, early career researcher team to explore uh, a shared research hypothesis, which is that under certain felicitous uh, conditions, trust, uh, conflict can actually produce trust rather than erode it. This working hypothesis, as many of you will know, goes against an established consensus in trust research, which stipulates that trust prevails um, primarily under conditions of socioeconomic and ethnic homogeneity. We find, and that's our working hypothesis, that this is not a useful explanation of the dynamics of conflict and trust in modern complex and diverse societies. We assume that in, to understand uh, societal dynamics in societies like the ones that we live in here in, in Germany, you have to develop a different model of how trust and conflict relate to each other. And you actually have to assume that under certain uh, um, uh, conditions, um, uh, conflict can actually be conducive to trust. So we're going against what you might call a communitarian consensus in uh, trust research um, to explore in uh, 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 var various areas, societal fields, um, uh, the dynamics of uh, trust and conflict. In doing so, we have both an empirical and a theoretical and normative perspective. So we um, uh, our team includes uh, social scientists, economists who do data-driven research and uh, look at specific empirical data sets and uh, concrete uh, cases. And our team also includes philosophers, political theorists, sociologists, uh, sociologists of culture who um, uh, will respond to the similar to, to similar problematics uh, with theoretical models, with conceptual um, innovations, and try to contribute to a uh, convergent view of the dynamics of uh, conflict and trust in diverse societies. We're particularly interested in justified trust, where not all forms of trust are born equal. Um, some forms of trust, we assume, are actually detrimental um, to uh, the overall welfare of complex and diverse societies. And uh, we're trying to identify uh, the conditions under which trust can be described as justified and actually endorsed from a normative uh, perspective. Um, currently, we explore this working hypothesis across five working groups, um, democracy, uh, coercion, 
that's the legal perspective, um, economics, uh, knowledge, and media. But going forward, as the current project is transformed into the longer term cluster project, um, we will limit ourselves to four fields, which are slightly differently organized um, and which are differentiated through four different types of uncertainty under which the, uh, the dynamics of conflict and trust play out. We look at political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty, and what we currently propose to call existential uncertainty, um, the situation in which violence uh, creates sort of a borderline case of uh, conflict and trust. Um, so we're designing currently and developing four research fields. One uh, about trust and conflict in political orders in the state and beyond. One on relations of socioeconomic exchange. One on practices of media and knowledge. And one on systems uh, of security. And the overall project is structured through our three um, key theoretical concepts, um, conflict, um, trust, conflict, and uncertainty. And as you will have gathered from looking at the program, this also provides the structure for uh, this conference. Uh, we have a panel on trust, one on conflict, and one on uncertainty. And that's how we go through about our work for the following day and a half. We're very honored to have you all here. Uh, we're uh, grateful to the university for the incredible support that we've been receiving um, in our work and our preparations of the larger scale research pro project up to date. And we're very grateful to all the speakers who've traveled from around the world to um, come here and work with us on what we believe is a really um, fascinating and potentially immensely productive working hypothesis. And in that sense, I hand over to Tobias, who will chair the first panel. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, warm welcome also from me. My name is uh, Tobias Wille. I'm an assistant professor of international security here at Goethe University, as well as a PI and the academic coordinator of the Contrast Initiative. And it will be my great pleasure to ch um, chair this first panel on conflict and trust. Um, uh, as Vincent said, uh, we're going to move through these three core concepts with our three panels uh, at this conference. And on this particular panel, we want to see, zoom in on the phenomenon of social conflicts and ask uh, what role trust and uncertainty play in them. So questions are, under what conditions can conflicts create or at least sustain trust? And when do they destroy it? How do trust and distrust interact in conflict processes? And how do different trust dynamics of, uh, affect the escalation, prolongation, freezing, or resolution of, of conflicts? And I think we could not have found better speakers to help us find answers to these very tricky questions than the four scholars we have on this panel. Uh, we will hear all their three presentations in one go and then have a, a substantive discussion afterwards. And I will introduce the uh, speakers uh, before their respective talks. Uh, each of the presentations will be about 20 minutes. So that should then leave us about an hour for discussions afterwards. Um, the first speaker on this panel is Michael Doyle. He is a university professor at Columbia University Press, affiliated there with the School of International and Public Affairs, the Department of Political Science and the Law School. And he's also currently a visiting research professor at the Social Science Center in Berlin. Um, but he's not only uh, one of the leading scholars in international relations, political theory, and international law. He's also an experienced political practitioner and international public servant amongst his roles. He was uh, um, the Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor for Policy Planning to United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. He has published widely in international, uh, on international migration, international relations theory, international law, and international peace building. Uh, most famous, uh, at least in my circles, are his writings uh, on the democratic peace. Uh, so the finding that democracies do not fight wars against each other. And uh, his texts there are assigned pretty much in every introduction to an IR as mandatory reading. I have taught them many times and enjoyed it a lot. Mm. Currently, Michael is working on a book titled Cold Peace that illuminates the origins of the new Cold War between the US and their allies on the one hand and Russia and China on the other. And his talk today will draw on this body of research. 
Michael, it's really great to have you here. Very much looking forward to your presentation. Tobias, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And to Reiner and, and Nicole and Vincent, thank you for inviting me again here to Frankfurt. Uh, every time I come here, I'm just astounded that a state government is is funding normative orders. It is it is outside the can of, of my experience, but I can only congratulate the state and what you do with their money. So <laughs> congratulations. Uh, as Tobias just mentioned, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, cooperation, trust and conflict in contemporary geopolitics. I'm drawing on a book that I've just finished called Cold Peace. It'll be uh, forthcoming in April of uh, 23, uh, the global paper chain crises permitting. My publisher tells me nothing is certain. Uh, what I'm gonna be doing is talking today about the dangers of a new Cold War. And in, the, in terms of the uh, insights and metaphors of your group, this relies heavily on antediluvian trust theory. That is that similarities produce trust, differences distrust. But then my prescriptions uh, on the need for what will be very difficult compromises between the US and Russia, the US and China, the regulation of cyberspace, is going to rely upon the ability of practical deals to generate trust. Now, that sounds very complicated, and I'm not speaking about it this, this evening, <laughs> partly for that reason, nor am I speaking about the historical chapters in the book. The book also includes uh, studies of the relationships between the democracies and Italian fascism in the 1920s and 30s, and the democracies and Japanese militarism after 1929, before that Japanese constitutionalism, uh, uh, which of course led to World War II. There is no prediction we're gonna have a World War III, the world is very different, but I'm also again, not talking about those historical chapters. So what I am, what I am talking about are the first two elements that you see in front of you, conflict and cooperation in theory and practice. And again, this is anti-Diluvian cooperation trust theory. And then some examples from Cold War I, the post-Cold War and new Cold War II, in which I'll talk about the instruments of the new Cold War, some of the sources, and you'll be pleased to hear some of the restraints that are very, that are likely to make Cold War II, even if we fail on those necessary compromises that I'm not talking about here, uh, to be less uh, horrendous than, than Cold War I. So that's the plan. Let's first go to theory. Uh, the international relations scholars, uh, we all start with a, a realist presupposition. It's heavily inspired by Hobbes's notion of anarchy with a security dilemma produced when rational, material, egoist interact without any overarching structure of authority. Under those circumstances, competition over material goods has no natural governing space. It escalates into violence if there's a particular good that you want and someone else has. Uh, competition over prestige and glory, Hobbes also warns us, without a regulatory force to decide what is prestigious and what is glorious, escal escalates again into conflict. And above all, without a regulatory governing authority, the individuals slash states in this world of anarchy have nothing to protect them but themselves. Their defensive measures in the security dilemma are taken as being offensive in intent. And under those circumstances, the natural logic is preemption, uh, bump off your threat before your threat bumps off you. That's the simple model of the Hobbesian state of war that we in our international relations courses often start with as the, the ground-based model of understanding anarchy in world politics. And a state of war is attractive time, Hobbes famously said, when the possibility of battle is known. So that's where we start. When we wanna get cooperation under 
anarchic circumstances, we go in two different directions in our theories. We either change the anarchy, create forms of, of structured governance, or we change the characters. We change the animals in the forest or we change the forest in these models. We change anarchy or we change the preferences. You can achieve cooperation, needless to say, one-sided through empire and hegemony, where the most powerful enforces its order on the rest. You can do it, our colleague Bob Axelrod from the University of Michigan has shown in some elegant game theoretic models through iteration, that is rational actors notice over time if the structure of incentives are right, that their failure to cooperate makes them both worse off. They learn a strategy of tit for tat, you cooperate, I cooperate over time, and that produces a rational advance of their circumstances through cooperation. Uh, the assumptions in Bob's model include perfect information, two actors, infinite time horizon, uh, the right structure of preferences. They're very long, but it's an elegant model. And then lastly, at the anarchic side, there is hegemonic cooperation, which mixes a bit of he hegemony and a bit of cooperation theory. Our friend Bob Cohan is the leading articulator of this. And the argument here is that if you have one really large power, the benefits that it personally or individually derives for, from cooperative activity can be so large that it can afford to fund the cost of providing the cooperation and the rest can free ride and therefore you can have cooperation. So that changes the anarchy, the interactive dimension. The other way that we enhance cooperation in our international relations theories and, and I apologize to those who teach it every, every day or so, Tobias and others, this will be too familiar, is compatible and similar preferences as a way to enhance trust and cooperation, the antediluvial uh, theory of trust and cooperation. And then in the political philosophy literature, if we make assumptions such as Locke's about life, liberty, and property as the basic uh, structured principles and preferences of rational individuals, all you need is authoritative and impartial interpretation, adjudication, et cetera, to arrive at cooperative solutions. Or uh, in the liberal democratic piece, again, inspired by Kant, uh, republics motivated by a sense of human dignity uh, with the constitutional ability to engage in deliberative governance have a possibility of a reasonable possibility of establishing peace with each other. So those are some of the ways in theory, in IR theory, that we uh, enhance cooperation and sometimes build trust. There's a whole other literature, which is absolutely fascinating, uh, pioneered by Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel uh, Prize in Economics. I can't tell you how happy that makes me as a political scientist, that a political scientist won the Nobel Prize in economics, given that we don't have one. It's, it's a wonderful set of scholarship on common pool resources. But I prefer a more ordinary level that takes a lot of insights coming from Ostrom. In a book by uh, Bob Ellickson, who teaches at uh, Yale Law School, Order Without Law. It's a lovely case study of Shasta Valley. This is a valley in California. Farmers and ranchers and how they succeed in cooperating. Normally farmers and ranchers, for all of us who have seen that wonderful musical Oklahoma, knows that they can't stand each other. But under these special circumstances, they succeed. The special circumstances are minimal social distance. That is similar circumstances. They're all rural, et cetera. Similar values, uh, lower and disaggregated rather than higher and existential stakes. They're fighting over where the fences go and mutual interdependence, the absence of third parties on whom the consequences and costs can be offloaded. And under those circumstances, Ellickson shows in this really quite lovely book that a cooperation can be achieved without state uh, regulation. So let's turn to the Cold Wars. Well, the first Cold War, which I'm beginning to call first, 1948 to 1990, 
was a period of, of extreme tension. Uh, it was a revolutionary conflict. Uh, Mr. Khrushchev's famous, we will bury you, which he did not mean a nuclear war. He meant out in compete industrially the West, but it was a deep and profound conflict over interest and legitimacy characterized as, as many of us are familiar with a binary conflict between blocks. It was bipolar, U.S. versus USSR, capitalism versus communism, dictatorship versus democracy in the competitive articulations that each presented. There was trust and cooperation, but it was externally forced within the blocs, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, based upon both similar values and hegemony on both sides. So it was a hard-nosed, old-fashioned form of trust. And of course, UN and global institutions tended to be marginalized. They had a role, but it was only at the margin. In the post-Cold War, 1990 to 2012, we saw an emergence of something more like Shasta Valley farmers. Uh, we had an articulation of human rights that was globally shared in the Vienna Declaration of 1993, which was a consensus document that had the acquiescence of Russia, China, and all other powers. It was not voted on, but it's a consensus document. And the other source of major consensus was on the development side, the Millennium Development Goals. Again, a consensus document. It was manipulated a little bit by we bureaucrats, but by and large, it was accepted by the entire General Assembly, with the exception of the United States uh, for five years, who resisted it. So we had shared values. Geopolitics, we had a unipolar system during this period where the US was clearly the predominant military power and we had globalization tying the world together and at the same time, multilateral activism. The UN came to uh, its fruition, beginning to act as the charter anticipated it would act with a very active peace building agenda. And of course the WTO was significant. They were a little bit like Shasta Valley farmers. The new Cold War, for which I date from 2012 on, is in a reemergence of tension. Uh, Secretary General Guterres described it as the Cold War is back with a vengeance, but with a difference. The mechanisms and safeguards of the past uh, don't exist in the same way. So he was warning on its dangers. What are the instruments? Then I'll talk about sources and then wrap up. The instruments, and I'm just going to briefly mention these to you rather than describe them, are criminal uh, cyber tax, that is ransomware, which has burst out across uh, the economy in the past decade, state-directed uh, sabotage, such as of the Ukrainian electric grid in 2014 and 15 by Russia, and of course, famously, on the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, 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 construction, uh, the spinning wheels creating nuclear material by the U.S. and Israel. There have been espionage hacks on major governments and private corporations by Russia, SolarWinds, and by China Pulse. The Norwegian parliament server was hacked. Industrial espionage is another way in which this Cold War is fought. It's a warlike conflict, but without the use of direct armed force, which is what makes it a Cold War. And there have been a number of those. Political subversion, such as the Russian uh, in the US and EU elections in 2016. There's an excellent study by the French government by Valjean Villemer on what happened in the European side. The Mueller report in the US is the equivalent. And of course, again, in 2020 by Russia. And of course, China alleges that the US organized the umbrella demonstrations and the extradition demonstrations in Hong Kong. And then lastly, of course, and most notoriously, proxy wars, such as the one currently being fought in Ukraine and, and the tensions that now exist across the Taiwan Strait. What are the sources? There are two major sources, one of them systemic, the other more transnational. The first is the famous Thucydides trap that Graham Allison has talked about. We see the rise of China challenging the predominance of especially the United States. At some point in the logic of hegemonic transitions, the old established power, Sparta for the Athenians, feels so threatened by the rising power that it strikes in a war. 
or alternatively, the rising power concerned that the conservative power might strike itself preempts. This kind of a war is inherently one of misperceptions and strategic misdirection. If you're the conservative established power, you have a strong incentive to portray every challenge to your authority as a challenge to the entire international order. Listen to every speech that President Biden has been giving for the past two years. If, on the other hand, you're a rising power, you have a strategic incentive to pretend as if you're fully within the system, you only want to play by the rules, you only want your fair shake of it. Listen to Mr. Xi's speeches, including the one from uh, Bali last week. So we have a strategic incentive to misinform um, each other, which enhances conflict. The other sources of strife are democracy versus autocracy uh, for a whole variety of ways, conflicts over legitimacy, corporatism versus market capitalism, state-directed economies versus market capitalism. Uh, the, the capitalists think that every transaction with a Chinese firm is one in which they're competing not just with the firm, but with the government, the intelligence operation, and everything behind that firm. That produces tension. And then at the ideological level, sovereign nationalism in the autocratic countries, Russia, China, versus liberal internationalism coming from the US and others, a conflict of conservative versus somewhat subversive human rights. Those are the deep sources. Uh, I'm wrapping up here. I know I'm pushing on time. There are some counters, thank goodness, that is likely to make this less contentious than Cold War I, even if we fail at the kind of compromises that I would like to take place. It's not a simple bipolar conflict. The EU has an economy equivalent to that of the United States. U.S. and China have a conflict that's security and economic. U.S. and Russia, security and military. It's not a conflict between capitalism and communism. As the 2021, there are more billionaires in China than there are in the U.S. It's not the kind of communist society that China used to be. There are also deep common interests between China, the U.S., and they are each other's best customers. And the same thing applies a fortiori in the EU. And lastly, there is allied reluctance that drags back uh, the, the predominant U.S., China, and Russia. On the U.S. side, Germany, France, Japan, India doubt U.S. consistency. They are concerned that in 2024, they may have to be dealing with a Mr. Trump. And they also have very profitable ties to Russia and China. Many African states see, for example, the current war in Ukraine as remote. Poverty and food are the conflicts that are at the center of their uh, survival. And also there's a common agenda. I, I pick up the phrase from the Secretary General's latest report that he put out on strategy for the UN. We have norms of a shared fate. And these, I think, provide grounds that through compromises might produce a cold peace, a preemptive detente before we get into a full-blown Cold War. First of all, it's worth remembering that even in the Cold War, there was cooperation, salt arms control, marginal UN peacekeeping. We remember the costs of the first Cold War and the need, therefore, for arms control. The U.S. spent $11 trillion on its own defense in the first Cold War against a much less dynamic economy of the Soviet Union. Think of how much would have to be spent if we got into a arms race with modern China. You know, just begin to multiply. We're tied together by global pandemics. Uh, the common experience of the disaster of a million plus lives creates a sense of, of common fate. And of course, global warming. We all know that with the effects that exist. And so I wrap up with a wonderful comment from Joseph Burrell, the EU foreign policy chief. The demand for multilateral solutions is much greater than supply. More divisions, more free riding, more distrust than the world can afford. Here he's talking about the new Cold War. <clears throat> we need global cooperation, he says, based upon agreed rules because the alternative is the law of the jungle where problems don't get solved. 
Every day we see the cost of the absence of multilateral action and reduced access to vaccines and insufficient climate action and peace and security co uh, conflicts that fester. That's where I'm gonna stop. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks for this very inspiring talk. Uh, lots of uh, food for thought and uh, also of course, lo lots of stuff to talk about later in the Q and A. But now we move on to the second presentation on, on this panel, uh, which will uh, be given by uh, Ashana Rambukwela. He is a professor in, the, uh, in English at the Postgraduate Institute of English at the Open University in Sri Lanka. He was a visiting fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna earlier this year, and is currently a visiting fellow at the Political Geography Department at the University of Zurich, from where he also came up this morning on a, on a train. Um, He's the author of The Politics and Poetics of an Authenticity, a cultural genealogy of Tinala nationalism, which appeared with UCL Press in 2018 and has published in journals such as Boundary 2, the Journal of Asian Studies, Journal of Commonwealth Literature and Postcolonial Text, and uh, many, many other. Ashana is also very active in the promotion of Anglophone literature. Uh, inter Alia as a trustee of the Gratian Prize for English Creative Writing, which was instituted by Michael Ondatje, the, the famous writer, and is also a member of the State Literary pa uh, Panel of Sri Lanka. Um, Hashan, it's really great to have you here and very much look forward to, to your presentation. Thank you very much, Tobias, for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you to the Contrast team, Professor, I hope I'm pronouncing these names correctly, Nicole. Dehtelov, Professor Vincent Hediger, and Professor Ryan Horst for inviting me, and to my colleague Pavan, who actually facilitated the introduction, and Tobias, who has been corresponding with me uh, all this time. Uh, so I think, I mean, we had a wonderful sort of macro vision of the global order with our first speaker. My own disciplinary training and approach is very, very different coming from literature and cultural studies, and my scale is also much, much more micro. I'm going to talk about contemporary Sri Lanka and things that happened in over the past few months. Some of you may be aware of it because it got quite a lot of international attention in the global media. Uh, and I must also confess uh, before I start the talk that I am personally invested in much of what I'm going to talk about today and that subjective element inevitably colors what I say and in and in some ways this is also uh, a somewhat risky proposition what I'm doing because I'm talking about something that is in flux at the moment and offering analysis of uh, social and political phenomenon as it unfolds is always difficult because I'm sort of soothsaying in some ways and and you know it, it 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 can go wrong spectacularly because all our readings can end up not uh so uh, when i initially conceived of this talk it was under very different circumstances i had just returned to sri lanka from a stay in europe the i was at the I, ivm in uh, vienna uh, at which time the aragale aragale is the singular term for struggle in sri lanka evolved rapidly as the country plunged into an unprecedented economic crisis my friends colleagues students former political and ideological adversaries had come together in an unprecedented show of unity to get rid of a political order they held responsible for Sri Lanka's predicament. Soon after returning on uh, to Sri Lanka on the 9th of July, I joined the hundreds of thousands that gathered in the capital Colombo and eventually stormed the presidential office and residence. I was, I mean, I was not at the front. I have to confess I was safely at the back, but I was there. Uh, images of which I'm sure most of you have seen on international media, you know, youngsters jumping into the president's pool and swimming, etc. So this was a surreal moment uh, because never in my life as a Sri Lankan had I experienced or imagined the poss possibility of poly uh, political change through direct people's action. The moment was also surreal because in a nation state with deep social and political cleavages, this seemed an event that transcended the history of enmity and divisiveness. If you know anything of Sri Lanka's post-independence history, you know, we have been embroiled in a 30-year ethnic conflict and we have had other regular youth uprisings and sort of blood sheddings almost every decade. Um, but with the Aragales moment of spectacular success, an all-powerful executive 
president fled the country and sub subsequently resigned. And by the way, in constitutional terms, the Sri Lankan presidency is probably the most powerful in the country. It took sort of some of the more worst features of the Gaullist constitution and the American constitution and combined them together without any of the checks and balances. Uh, so the executive presidency is incredibly powerful in Sri Lanka. Uh, but, you know, so he fled and he resigned. But at the same time came the Aragales' greatest defeat. The political order that the Aragales sought to defeat reasserted itself very swiftly. The newly appointed president, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who had legal sanction but little legitimacy uh, or moral authority to govern, swiftly unleashed a wave of repression. The Aragale disintegrated and so did the solidarity or solidarities that appeared to have formed around it. This then begs the question, was Sri Lanka's Aragale a transient and ephemeral phenomenon? In the last decade, we have seen a number of such uprisings, the Arab Spring, the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, or the Occupy Wall Street movement. Most of these have fizzled out, and their social and political gains remain somewhat contested. Was Sri Lanka's experience similar? My attempt here is to briefly explore the recent events in Sri Lanka through the lens of solidarity. And one might ask, why solidarity? Solidarity, of course, has a long history as a concept used to understand collective political action. The word itself, if you, if you consider the etymology, has connotations of mutual responsibility and reciprocality and, and of substance, of not being hollow. The original sort of Latin term has that connotation as well. However, at the same time, solidarity is also a contested and fuzzy concept. While it can foster unity, such unity can also be premised against others. You, have, you can easily have conflicting solidarities. For instance, if you think about the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka, it was also about conflicting solidarities. Uh, so it can foster parochial and clannish forms of association. I believe the diffuse nature of solidarity or at least the way I conceive of it, provides an analytical heuristic that allows me to speak about the multiple contradictions that shape the Aragale, and that is why I chose solidarity as a framework. I mean, there are other frameworks that I could have chosen from. Um, so I will initially provide a brief mapping of solidarity as a concept, and thereafter I will move to the Sri Lankan context where I will explore the people's uprising and its contradictions in relation to this notion of solidarity. Uh, before I proceed, the image that you see there uh, is a piece of installation art that appeared in the main protest site uh, in Colombo, which was called Gota Go Gama or Gota Go Home. Gota is the nickname for the president, Gota Be Rajapaksha. Uh, that is a type of slipper. It's a bata. It's called a bata in uh, most of South Asia. You find this. It's a very cheap kind of slipper worn by common people. And as you can see, it's worn out at the back. It has been used very much. And what it's trampling is a tear gas canister. So it's an obvious metaphor for people's power against state repression. Uh, so to move on to kind of try and map solidarity on a larger scale, uh, solidarity in geopolitical terms is overdetermined by pragmatic concerns, though one can also, I mean, often it's uh, sort of overdetermined by pragmatic concerns, but one can also imagine instances where states do act non instrumentally, that there is a higher purpose, maybe a moral purpose behind why a state would show solidarity to another nation state. It also tends to be hierarchical often with more powerful nations helping the less fortunate. For instance, India came up with the slogan neighborhood first when Sri Lanka began to face its economic crisis. But you can also see a very instrumental dimension to that help because India was intervening to countervail China's influence in Sri Lanka. And that was very, very clear. Uh, however, even geopolitical solidarity, though it is, in, uh, is informed by a notion of mutual interest that dis distinguishes it from similar ideas such as justice or general duty towards society. So though the motivation in geopolitical solidarity may be pragmatic at core, reciprocity remains an important underlying principle. I think any form of solidarity has that kind of reciprocal dimension to it. Solidarity on a micro scale, so if you move from that sort of nation state model to something smaller, though seemingly less instrumental, can also be pragmatic. For instance, social contracts that benefit society as a whole are not necessarily based on altruism. One's contribution to the collective good can stem from self-interest. For instance, if you contribute to a national health system for something, 
uh, you know, you do so because you also benefit in the end. One can also argue that this is not inherently negative because an exclusively communitarian approach where solidarity is prim primarily about responsibility to the collective can result in conflicting solidarities, essentially creating clannish in and out group structures, what I spoke about earlier. So therefore, a key conceptual and political challenge in trying to understand is trying to understand how solidarity might work with diversity. So I think in some ways, uh, the previous talk also touched on this. I think one of the problems here is how do you deal with diverse societies and, and, and with people with diverging interests? Uh, even in the sociological literature, there is a privileging of solidarity when it is informed by a compulsion to engage with others unlike you. For instance, Durkheim distinguishes between mechanical solidarity associated with traditional societies and a communal sense of belonging or obligation with what he calls organic solidarity, which he associates with more modern, diverse societies. Uh, Durkheim actually uses the analogy of the body where he says, you know, different parts of the body operate independently, but there is a unifying principle that coordinates that action. Uh, a fundamental problem that then follows on from this distinction between solidarity in a homogeneous social context versus solidarity in diversity is under what conditions a sense of obligation towards others like oneself can emerge. One could then argue that solidarity with some element of duty or care towards the other may be considered a less impoverished form of solid solidarity that is largely in uh, uh, solidarity in comparison to a form of solidarity that is uh, shaped by instrumental motives alone. As I shall discuss in rela relation to Sri Lanka, these tensions in solidarity uh, between instrumentality, reciprocity, and expressing uni unity with others like unlike yourself have a direct relevance to the understanding of the Aragale. Uh, this is in terms of who participated, what forms that participation took, and the limits of the unity that emerged during this period of political struggle. One can also add another layer of complexity to solidarity through the notion of misrecognition. Such mis misrecognition has been historically visible when progressive agents have identified themselves with struggles they perceive as worthy. Some scholars have theorized this as enchanted solidarity. Scholar, uh, colleagues from here, uh, Pavan and Professor Frank and Schulz, uh, have written about this uh, in relation to postcolonial uh, studies and postcolonial literature. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there is a history uh, of this. Uh, for instance, when early international commentary valorized militant Tamil nationalism uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, there was a problem because Milton Tamil nationalism in some ways offered very little as a moral counterpoint to single majoritarianism. In a way, the, the dominant form of Tamil nationalism replicated uh, the majoritarian premises of single nationalism. So there was no real moral, ethical alternative offered by it, while it was a minority struggle. Uh, so while you could stand with the politics of the struggle, the imagination that shaped the struggle was problematic still. Uh, because, for instance, how they marginalize Muslims and other minorities in the country. Uh, and this is a situation not unique to Sri Lanka. It is a dilemma poignantly captured in the poetry of James Fenton, Oxford professor of poetry and one-time war correspondent in Vietnam and Cambodia. In his deeply reflective and self-critical poem, In a Notebook, Fenton reflects on his own com complicity in espousing solidarity with the Khmer regime. The poem begins with an idyllic pastoral scene of youth setting out to war. And I quote, I sat drinking bitter coffee, wishing the tide would turn to bring me to my senses after the pleasant war and the evasive answers. A few stanzas later, the same scene is repeated in reflective hindsight. And the tide turned and brought me to my senses. The pleasant war brought the unpleasant answers. The villages were burnt, the cities void. The morning light has left the river view. The distant followers have been dismayed, and I am afraid, reading this passage now, that everything I knew has been destroyed by those whom I admired but never knew. The laughing soldiers fought to their defeat, and I am afraid most of my friends are dead. The line, distant followers have been dismayed, uh, pitily captures the dilemma of enchanted solidarity. 
uh, you know, of, of identifying with something you think is progressive, but as the distance becomes closer, you become more proximate to the problem, you realize that you have actually misrecognized it. Uh, but however, having said this, distance is relative. One could be physically and even ideologically proximate to a struggle, but still be enchanted. Because on July 9th, when I stood with that thronging mass, I was enchanted. But now, several months down the line, with the gains of the Aragalia swiftly reversed, I take a more critical view. However, does that mean what we witnessed in the Aragalia was transient or was something more substantive? How am I doing for time? Okay, should be able to cover this. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me also give a little bit of context to what happened in Sri Lanka, because I assume uh, not everyone in the audience would have that much familiarity. Uh, so with the end of the 30-year civil war in 2009, there was a very bloody conclusion to the war. Uh, the Rajapaksha dynasty or the Rajapaksha family positioned itself as the savior of the Sinhala majority. Under Mahinda Rajapaksha, who was two-time executive president, the Sinhala majority formed an unprecedented racialized unity, which effectively marginalized minority political parties from the electoral process. Because from 1948, since independence, Sri Lanka has had a two-party system uh, where the Sinhala vote was essentially split 50-50 between these two parties. So the minorities always got to play a very key role in the electoral process by forming alliances. But this was erased by the Rajapakshas. They managed to create this kind of ideological homogeneity within the Sinhala uh, majority, which has effectively marginalized the minority uh, vo voting power. Uh, so, uh, however, in so, I mean, so from 2009 onward to 2015, they built this major dynasty riding on the uh, the, the capital of the war victory because they appeared as the saviors of the Sinhala nation, not the Sri Lankan nation, but the Sinhala nation. However, in 2015, Rajapaksha's dream of an unprecedented third term ended when he was ousted by a rainbow coalition of political forces. While this political out ouster was facilitated by a hastily cobbled together political co coalition, it was tenuous and lasted barely four years because the Sinhala nationalist ideology that underwrote Rajapaksha dominance remained uncontested. And with the infamous Easter Sunday attacks of 2019, it facilitated an even more frightening and powerful return of the Rajapakshas. The younger Rajapaksha brother, Gotabe, became the president. Uh, but what happened over the past few months is important because the solidarity that emerged during the Aragalia offered a transient but nevertheless significant break in the majoritarian single nationalist social contract that facilitated the Rajapaksha dynasty's hold over Sri Lankan politics. The extreme economic precarity the country faces, the subsequent mobilization of the people, and the aggressive state counter-reaction marks a rare moment when the Sinhala majority community experienced a form of existential insecurity that has been all too familiar to the minorities in the country, but the Sinhalese people have never experienced this. So it it was defamiliarizing for them. It was suddenly they were minoritized in a state where they imagined they could never face something like that. However, this does not mean the Aragale succeeded in transcending deep-seated ethno-racial and cultural divisions in Sri Lankan society. So as you can also see, I mean, the way this paper fits into conflict and trust is that there was this moment of conflict produces some form of trust, very tenuous, very fleeting, but there is something there. What it did offer was a glimpse of political and social possibilities and the potential for a more robust and inclusive form of solidarity. The antecedents of the Aragale lie in a series of nationwide protests by various groups ranging from school teachers to farmers, uh, resulting from serial governance blunders by the administration of President Gotab Gotabe Rajapaksha, uh, a man who was presented as Sri Lanka's Mahathir Mohammed or Lee Kuan Yew. He was supposedly the technocrat who would take Sri Lanka to vistas of splendor. That was the title of his policy uh, document. When fuel and medicine shortages and 10-hour power cuts forced a usually complacent urban middle class onto the streets, the threat of economic annihilation had broken the Rajapaksha aura and at the same time damaged the Sinhala majoritarian social contract which underwrote the Rajapaksha's political success. Uh, 
When state repression on a wide scale was unleashed on peaceful protesters, there was a further break between the Sinhala majority and the Sinhala nationalist state, which Sinhala people since political independence in 1948 had seen as their guardian. However, this also marks the potentials and limitations of the Aragale. The Aragale remained a largely southern political phenomenon in Sri Lanka. If we understand the political geography of Sri Lanka rather schematically as a division between the Sinhala South and the, of the country and the North and East of the country as minority dominated areas, the Aragale's locus remained southern. Minority participation in the Aragale in the North and East remained distinctly lackluster. This is also due to a long history of how a highly militarized and ethnicized state has dealt with minority uprisings. However, having made these critical observations, let me now say something about the potential of solidarity that the Aragale offered. I know I'm a little over time, but I'm almost done. Uh, the main protest site in capital Colombo, which featured a mini cinema, a library, an IT tent, uh, among other facilities, at the height of the struggle resembled a township and was called Gota Go Gama or Gota Go Home Village. The solidarity this space generated was visible in the different groups that were present. For instance, the Inter-University Students Federation, a university students union with national reach, but with a controversial and dark history of violence in universities. Representatives of leftist political parties, such as the Frontline Socialist Party, which styles itself as the radical left, uh, and who had advocated for the violent overthrow of the state. Representatives of the Ranaviru or war veterans, uh, you know, which is a very problematic discourse in Sri Lanka because they, they are used to show up Sinhala nationalism all the time. Members of the political party of the controversial ex-commander Sarat Fonseca who's accused of war crimes. Uh, and amidst all of these, there were hardline Sinhala nationalist Buddhist monks along sorry, alongside Catholic, Christian, Muslim, and Hindu clergy. There were also LGBTQ activists and avant-garde artists. Professional groups such as doctors and particular, particularly lawyers also provided support. One could argue that their presence simply meant a pragmatic and transient uni unity against a common foe. But while such a reading is not incorrect, I would also argue that there was what scholars of solidarity call a shared value horizon at play. Beyond the immediate need to address the economic instability and get rid of the Rajapaksha government, there was and continues to be a growing consensus about the need for a distinct change in the political culture of the country. But this change remains fuzzy. However, the economic precarity and the vulnerability in relation to state repression that people experience has created a sense of reciprocal recognition that I believe could rise above the histories of ethno-nationalist divisions that have long characterized Sri Lanka. I will end there because I'm over time. There's a little bit more, but I can take it in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashana, for this very inspiring uh, talk um, on solidarity and the problem of trust, in a sense. Um, which I think also very nice builds a bridge actually between the macro problem Michael was uh, talking about and the more kind of micro problem of trust and, uh, and social organization within social movements. Uh, Anna and Irina will be talking about and I already saw a lot of nodding there. So I think, I think uh, things will fall in place nicely. Um, but uh, before I hand it over to you, I'll, I'll briefly introduce you. Uh, Hannah Pfeiffer is an assistant professor of political science with a focus on radicalization and violence research here at Goethe University Frankfurt and at the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt, where she's also uh, heading the research group on terrorism. And she's also a PI here at Contrast. Her research focuses on political violence, the relationship between st uh, states and um, non-state actors in the Middle East and North Africa, as well on democratic and non-democratic foreign and security policy. Amongst the many publications, I only want to highlight one here because it also quite not, uh, is quite relevant to the topic we are, we're discussing here, namely a volume on armed non-state actors and the politics of recognition she recently co-edited with Anna Geis and Maeva Clement. And Irene weipert fenner is a project leader at the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt and a PI here at Contrast. Uh, working in comparative politics, her research focuses on autocracies and democratization, as well as protests and social movement, uh, with a, a regional focus on the Middle East and North Africa. And in 1919, Irene um, held the interim chair of Middle Eastern politics at Philips University of Marburg. Her book, The Autocratic Parliament, Power and Legitimacy in Egypt, 1866 to 2011, uh, appeared in 2020 with Syracuse University Press. Uh, it's great to, to have you on, on this panel and I'm looking forward to your presentation.
Thanks so much, Tobias, for the kind introduction. And thanks for giving us the chance to present a working paper to you that is forthcoming now in the contrast uh, working paper series, where we deal with trust dynamics in context of extreme uncertainty. And as you can tell by the Vita, we will have uh, two types of conflict on offer. One is on uh, civil wars and the other one is on uh, contentious politics. So just to briefly link to what Contrast is doing and how we try to contribute here. As you've heard before, uh, Contrast, uh, uh, we as Contrast PIs believe that trust can grow in and through conflict um, under conditions of uncertainty. Uncertainty is important to us here. As Rainer Forst just recently elaborated in a working paper as well, uncertainty is constitutive of trust. Without uncertainty, we wouldn't need trust. But trust also presupposes sufficient certainty in uncertainty. So for us, the question is what happens to trust relations under conditions of extreme uncertainty? We like to argue that some forms of trust are undermined while others form or transform. But we will have to look at these dynamics through a temporal lens, as we will do in the presentation. And as I said, we look in the Middle East and North Africa and two different types of conflict. I'll start with a brief overview of what we know about trust in, in the MENA region. I will hand over then to Hannah for some conceptual ideas about trust, extreme uncertainty, and time, and her input on political trust and rebel governance during civil war. And then I'll come up with social trust and contentious politics in post-conflict societies and a few conclusions. So what do we know or what do we don't know about trust in the MENA? So we know the trust studies originally come from the West and this created certain biases in the application uh, first to the Middle East and North Africa. Um, at first, there were a lot of like uh, culturalist explanations in terms of religious authority is what people trust, but not political institutions, um, as well as then institutionalist explanations that would try to explain low political trust by low performance. Uh, there's a lot to tell, but I'll spare you the details. We can discuss this later. But what the research afterwards um, has shown that different trust forms, political and social trust, are interrelated in very complex ways, and we have ambiguous empirical findings. Um, one general uh, key message that also we in contrast have is that low trust doesn't, low political trust doesn't need to be a bad thing. So in the MENA, Amani Jamal already early argued that this can be desirable as low political trust can be a driver for political change. To the best of our knowledge, however, no one has studied trust during armed conflict and within protest movements um, in the Middle East and North Africa so far. And this is what we like to contribute. Um, yes, and with that, I pass on to Hannah. Yeah, thank you very much, Irene. So let me um, give you some ideas on our theoretical framework. So we follow some standard definitions and distinctions, which may be very familiar to the crowd in this room. Um, generally, we understand trust as the belief that a person will not be harmed by others. But more specifically, uh, we follow Rainer Forst's four-digit concept of trust, which is also well familiar in this room. A trusts B in context C, in relation to D, which highlights that trust is a relational and dynamic process and is notably localized in certain social contexts. We also draw on the established distinction between political trust as trust placed in institutions and social as horizontal trust with the different subforms. What is more important for our uh, paper is an observation from Luhmann's work on trust. So Luhmann starts with the idea that trust grows in situations uh, of familiarity as interpersonal trust. However, this changes with the process of societal differentiation. In differentiated societies, familiarity is no longer available as a source of trust. And this absence creates a new trust need because it increases uncertainty. And in this situation of exacerbated uncertainty, um, it is that system trust emerges as an alternative to interpersonal trust. And this system trust is no longer based on familiarity, but on the performance of systems, or what we know as political trust. From this, we can learn that increased uncertainty has this double quality. On the one hand, existing sources of trust are undermined. On the other hand, new trust is needed. 
And this makes moments of uncertainty also moments, as we argue, of trust production or emergence, at least potentially. Now we transfer this Luhmannian idea um, to context of what we call extreme uncertainty. With this, we refer to situations in which the basic organization of society and politics is at disposition and where violent contestation reaches a degree that is life-threatening to individuals and groups, but potentially also to the reproduction of society as a whole. Such situations um, may lead us to revise our policies and habits of trusting, as Jones put it. Our commonsensical understanding um, of whom can be trusted and whom we should definitely not tr trust is temporarily suspended, or we could say that our trust compass gets disoriented, at least for a limited time. And this is very important that this is only a temporary suspension and, and this links up very nicely with the previous talk, that there's also a productive side to these moments of extreme uncertainty. Moments of extreme uncertainty allow for the effective self-constitution of a new we. Our thesis is thus that faces of extreme uncertainty not, uh, yield not only the loss, but also uh, the emergence of certain trust forms, as Irene already said in the beginning. And in the empirical part of the paper, we discuss this thesis with regard to two contexts of extreme uncertainty in the MENA, civil war and contentious politics. More specifically, we first um, analyze political trust in war zones by investigating rebel governance and civil war. Rebel governance um, refers uh, to the activities of insurgents um, in such a war zone, um, which aim at regulating the social, political, and economic life of civilians. And rebels do not necessarily come to mind um, first when we think about trust. But at the same time, it seems very plausible that rebel governance both requires a certain level of trust and produces trust over time. In the paper, we distinguish between synchronous and diachronous trust dynamics. And as Irene said, these temporal dynamics are very important for us. Synchronous refers to what happens at the same time in various places and what the simultaneous presence of various actors means for political trust. Now, one finding of the recent rebel governance debate is that rebels will opt for different institutions at different localities. And that this choice is based on the levels of trust the local population has in certain pre-existing institutions. This, by the way, also means that we cannot simply say that a rebel group, group is trusted or not. Rather, we have to differentiate. It is trusted with regard to certain institutions, but maybe not others. What is more, situations of civil war could also be described as a trust market. So uh, authority is violently contested in civil wars and rebel groups compete with other state and non-state actors over the trust of the population. And they may sometimes be more successful than the incumbent government. Refkin, for example, showed this for the case of ISIS in Iraq. ISIS had allowed civilians uh, living in Mosul to leave the city during the first months of its rule. But an estimated 75% of the population were still living there eight months after the group's arrival. And Refkin actually argues that staying was an indicator of civilian preferences for ISIS system of governance over that of the Iraqi state. This may sometimes also be the uh, result of an attribution problem. In complex civil wars, governance is simultaneously provided by a variety of actors the state, rebel groups like ISIS, but also international donors and third parties. It is not always easy for civilians to know who actually provides a certain good or service, and thus whose performance to judge or whom to trust politically. Moving on to, a uh, to a diachronous dynamics, we see that there is a sequencing of political trust and a deep embeddedness of rebels' attempts to build trust in pre-existing trust structures. First, rebels uh, choose to build some institutions first rather than others. And this has a lot to do with what kind of trust they uh, need to gain first. There are different trust needs at different stages of conflict. 
ISIS, for example, prioritized order and security in Syria, which meant that they invested in courts and the police rather than other institutions as a way of building basic trust in the everyday, we could say. This shows that rebels' political trust building may actually be very strategic and incremental and that they learn over time. What is more, rebel governance and active rebel trust building does not take place in a vacuum. So we always need to focus on what trust structures rebels find and what they do with them. They may take over successful institutions and benefit from existing trust credits, we could say. In other cases, it might be very easy for them to gain trust for institutions which were not trustworthy under the old or incumbent regime. And this is again what happened in Iraq when ISIS gained high levels of legitimacy and trust in the initial state building project through the consequent penalty of certain crimes like petty theft um, and the like because the police was so corrupt in the previous regime. So it was easy for them to benefit in this regard. You could also think of the Taliban in Afghanistan who were able to provide basic security in some areas and gain political trust through that. So actors may actually be um, well aware where they can gain comparative trust advantages, if you will. But it, this is not the whole story um, because conversely, and I want to end on this um, note before I hand over to Irene, uh, rebel civilian trust relations may also point to the potential for resistance. As Arsted showed for the education sector in Mosul and ISIS, uh, everyday resistance practices in schools and by educators were widespread, and also among parents who would no longer send their kids to school. There was some resistance in the classroom, as she calls it. What does that have to do with previously existing solid trust relations? For example, trust among teachers and students or teachers and um, the students' parents or trust place in certain forms of knowledge and knowledge production. These resilient forms of trust um, may actually allow for active distrusting towards actors like ISIS. And I would like to investigate this further in the future, but would now hand over to Irina. All right, uh, thanks, Hanna. So let's move on now to social trust um, and protest movements. Uh, the empirical background um, of my part is the second wave of the Arab uprisings with its peak in 2019 and the countries that you see here. Um, when we compare the first uh, wave, which is uh, publicly known as the Arab Spring of 2011, and the second wave, we can see that um, similarly in both um, uh, waves protesting side by side across social cleavages, across religious and ideological cleavages across gender and social milieus was widespread. And so were cross ideological alliances. Nothing super surprising for anyone studying movements um, globally, particularly mass movements and revolutions. Um, national identity was kind of the uniting factor here. However, what is surprising uh, for the second wave um, of uh, the Arab uprisings was that not only were people protesting across cleavages, they were also protesting against these cleavages, against ethnic cleavages, particularly important in Algeria, but also against inter and intra-religious cleavages in Lebanon and in Iraq in 2019. I like to focus on these two cases because I find them particularly astonishing. What I mean by uh, particularly astonishing is that in those two countries, protesters were also asking for changes of the political system, for the abolishment of the quota system that distributes power, political offices along sect ethno-sectarian lines. You see here the protest slogan of Lebanon, La li hukumat al muhasasa no trust in the government of the quota system. On the other hand, I would say Iraq and Lebanon are the least likely cases for anti-cleavage anti protests, if you want. Both countries have a recent civil war history. They are highly divided um, in societies along ethno-religious lines. They are surrounded by civil war after failed revolutions. And they are massively targeted by the rivalry of a regional hegemony along religious lines. By that, I mean Saudi Arabia versus Iran. And maybe sometimes underestimated, both countries are cases of limited statehood. 
So in both countries, there's a great importance of clientless networks to provide for security and welfare on these networks are structured along ethno-religious lines. That means calling for an end uh, of the power distribution um, along these lines means also you might end your foot in the door to security and to welfare. But still, at the same time, we see uh, the so-called October revolutions breaking out into the two countries. They have different initial catalysts. It doesn't matter so much because both are successful in bringing out, down the prime minister and uh, the cabinets. Both remain non-violent, although they face massive violence, particularly in Iraq, from state and militias. They remain, they remain leaderless and anti-partisan. And most importantly here for us, they raise anti-cleavage demands, so um, uh, reform demands of the political system at the beginning of the protest cycle. So where does this trust come from at the very beginning? Again, we have the same pattern here. Let's look at the synchronous dynamics first. We start with the huge political distrust that motivates these movements that is combined with the state repression they face and the moral shocks they create. That meets with the exceptionality of the mass protest in a positive way, the euphoria that was just so nicely described. Um, and that's le this leads to an effective community among protesters which might explain personal trust because you share the positive emotions and you might trust the other one that you know. But symbols and chants uh, are raised against the social divisions that require maybe a starting point of social trust, but it also increases social trust when you hear the other ones also uh, calling for national unity. A vision of a new state uh, is raised and lived at the same time, which brings up political trust, but political trust in a future political system and trust in the future in this context or in these contexts uh, is something new, that suddenly the future is open to being shaped. I'd like to quote um, um, an article, Lovati and Proserpio um, nicely analyzed the first month of the Iraqi uprising and they put it this way. The violence of uh, the state uh, security forces was also strategically used by activists to construct an image of sharp contrast with the joyful, peaceful, inclusive nature of the protest movement and their vision of a new inclusive Iraqiness. And they also highlight that this picture, this image of a doomed Iraq was overcome here. And it was really like there was a contrast uh, with this new Iraqiness they lived. At the same time, it's interesting to see that the political distrust, so the beginning of all these trust dynamics I elaborated on, spilled over to the protest movements themselves. In both countries, there was a complete rejection of any leadership. So the distaste of the political turned uh, against the movement, so they didn't have any organizational leadership position. It was all rejected. But of course, also these protests didn't come completely out of the blue. Around 50% were first time protesters. That means the other one have a history here. So it's important to look at the last 10 years, the protest decade here and the trust dynamics, the success and failure, the lessons learned. So actually there were experiments with identity-based protests, but people saw that they remain limited. Same thing with integrating political leaders, because then the anti-sectarian appeal is lost at once. Nonviolence proved uh, helpful already earlier on and the combination of political and economic demands. Um, so there was experiments between a complete rejection of the existing system, but also being specific, not to be portrayed as simply anarchist uh, movement that uh, threatens the stable order, but to combine it. And these lessons learned were also uh, lessons learned by managing internal conflicts inside the movements. So there were conflicts about how to go about this and they solved it and there were established uh, dense networks. So to conclude, what do we learn from the comparative reading of uh, civil war contexts and contentious politics in highly divided societies for comparative politics and potentially also IR? So we see that political trust can be built even under conditions of war, that political distrust can create new ground for social trust, but might also lead to a lack of trust inside the movements or have other spillover effects. Well, we found out while, uh, while writing this paper, actually, that we should be aware that uh, one context conflict might be, of course, interconnected with another context conflict. So Iraq was our overlapping case. Um, 
And we found that there were spillover effects between the different conflicts. So uh, the ISIS experience um, was the background of the moral shock perception in Iraq. So uh, force, um, violence by state security forces was perceived with this background. So we see that uh, different trust dynamics come together here. We saw that effective communities uh, can see a quick increase of social trust um, and also of political trust in a future political system. Um, the question, of course, is um, how stable that is. And this brings me to the final remark, the ambiguous nature of uncertainty that Hannah alluded to as well. High uncertainty is a moment of high risk, certainly, but it also allows for an open future. So the question is, is this extraordinary trust, is this trust something else? Is it trust in extraordinary times? And what happens to it afterwards? This is something we cannot um, answer yet. But still, the trust dynamics we find here, I think, are worth uh, to discuss um, with the great panelists here, but also with you. So thanks so much. Uh, this is based on a working paper that will uh, be published in the next days on, on our homepage. So if you're interested, want to read the argument, possibly cite it, then uh, visit our homepage. There are also many other papers that will go online there shortly. Um, so I would propose that we now first collect a couple of questions and reactions from the audience and uh, then give the panel uh, the opportunity to respond, obviously also to react to the to the other uh, presentations and then we do another round and then probably we will run out of time, but we'll basically just keep on going till quarter to six. Um, yes, please. <laughs> 